My name is Patrick Reynolds, and I am the Director of Public Programs at the Oneida County History Center. Derek Pratt is here from the Erie Canal Museum in Syracuse, currently Director of Education and Public Program. He's here to talk about food and the program in an initiative called Erie Eats, so let's give him a hand. Thanks. Everyone can hear me fine? Or should I get... Okay. All right. That's better? Cool. I'll move closer as well. All right. Uh, well, thanks for having me here um, to talk about the history of food on the Erie Canal. This talk came out of, what was it, 2021, I guess. Uh, I became our interim curator at the Erie Canal Museum, uh, made a whole exhibit uh, on the history of food, uh, also talked to people who were involved in modern day history uh, of food on the canal and everything. It was a fascinating process. And here's a little uh, snippet of what we, we have um, from that exhibit. Uh, also, if you're interested in learning more, uh, we did make uh, produce a book with all of, many people said the exhibit I made was like I wrote a book on the wall. That's why no one read it all. Um, but you can get it in physical copy now too um, and actually read it. We also have a uh, historic cookbook um, from a uh, barge canal cook um, in the back. You can find that on our website, eriecanalmuseum.org. But anyway, uh, let's talk about the foodways of the Erie Canal. There's three big questions this talk is going to answer uh, that we need to understand, at least, to get the rest of the talk. What is the Erie Canal? What is the Erie Canal Corridor? And what are foodways? Uh, the first two are probably the easiest, at least for me, as a canal person. Here it is. There it is, the Erie Canal, uh, an artificially made waterway uh, connecting Lake Erie uh, to the Hudson River. Um, 363 miles long, overcoming 571 feet in elevation change. Uh, did that through uh, 83 locks. It was really an engineering marvel uh, of its day. Uh, and it was built, owned and operated by the state at around uh, a little over $7 million uh, originally. And the, the New York State Canal System continues to be owned and operated by New York State to this day, which is an important thing to remember. Uh, you'll also notice on this map a number of side canals uh, that moved laterally off what we call the main spine of the Erie. Uh, Utica itself was home to one of the, the terminus of one of these, um, the Shenango Canal. Uh, out in Rome, they had the Black River Canal as well. Um, and what we define as the canal corridor typically uh, is 25 miles uh, off of the Erie Canal. And even to this day, between 70 and 80 percent of all of New York's population continues to live within that corridor. So you can see just how impactful um, the canal's construction was in determining settlement patterns, um, which we're going to look at. Um, so the other question, what are foodways? Well, here's the official definition. Uh, foodways are the cultural, social, and economic practices relating to the production and consumption of food. Foodways often refer to the intersection of food in culture, traditions, and history. So pretty much anything and everything that has to do with food, uh, and as you're going to see throughout this talk, uh, beverages as well. They're quite important too. Um, so to understand how the Erie Canal transforms the foodways of New York uh, and uh, in many cases America, we have to go back to before there was an Erie Canal. Here we've got New York, uh, 1809. Uh, this is a map from our collection. Um, and obviously there were people here uh, long before the canal was built. Uh, the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois Confederacy uh, lived throughout what is now the Canal corridor, it's their ancestral homelands, and they had a rich food culture and continue to have a rich food culture themselves uh, based primarily on uh, these three plants, uh, what are known as the three sisters, uh, corns, beans, and squash. Um, typically planted um, in a mound um, all together. Um, it's an incredible system of symbiosis. Uh, all three sisters work together um, to 
support one another. Uh, the corn typically grows first, going, growing straight and tall, uh, which allows the beans to wrap up around the, the corn stalks, providing uh, poles for them. Uh, the beans also replenish nitrogen in the soil, which the squash and uh, corn deplete. Um, and meanwhile, um, at the base uh, of these mounds grows the squash, which its la large kind of broad leaves uh, both keep uh, insects and pests away and also retain moisture. Um, so this is a super uh, effective um, agricultural system the Haudenosaunee develop. Uh, it's augmented by hunting and fishing, um, as well as gathering of naturally occurring uh, fruits, vegetables, herbs, roots, that sort of thing. Um, and typically what their diet consists of, uh, the cuisine they're making is largely soups, stews, and you know, like kind of roasted meats on a fire. Um, Starting in the 1600s, you start having Europeans begin to show up. Uh, they move, uh, originally the Dutch, move up the Hudson River and then the Mohawk River. Uh, and in the Mohawk area, they start building farms, um, these, these European uh, settlers, um, introducing new food stuffs to the area, uh, notably wheat and livestock like uh, cows and pigs. Um, however, these early settlers are hindered in a lot of ways by in continuing to, to grow these farms. They're largely kind of self-sustaining farms, not producing food for market because of the relatively poor transportation offered by the Mohawk River. Uh, it has a lot of rapids and waterfalls and stuff on it. It makes producing for a market like New York City uh, almost impossible to do profitably. Um, so, yeah, largely these farms, originally Dutch, then you get German, Welsh, Scotch-Irish uh, is kind of the major uh, settlers of the Mohawk Valley. Um, they're introducing these new crops. They're also um, learning from the Haudenosaunee some of these other crops and planting uh, techniques. Similarly, uh, the Haudenosaunee are adapting to uh, foodstuffs like wheat and uh, especially uh, livestock, they start incorporating that more into their diets. And also, um, these early settlers, remember we said the Haudenosaunee primarily eating soups, stews, kind of roasted meats? That's the same for Europeans um, because they're, they're all cooking on the same stuff, essentially, uh, fireplaces, right? Um, you're kind of limited in what you can make, um, which will change as we will see. Um, so that's where we, we see um, in the uh, Revolutionary War, um, you have the Sullivan Clinton campaign, which uh, moves partially through the Mohawk Valley, but really hits the, the Finger Lakes region. Uh, it's a scorched earth campaign by the Revolutionary uh, Army, um, burns hundreds of thousands of bushels of Iroquois crops, uh, in part, or of Haudenosaunee crops, uh, in part to kind of starve them out of the area and drive them out, um, which that newly quote unquote cleared land becomes very um, lucrative um, or appealing to uh, post-revolution settlers who start moving more and more into central and western New York um, to take advantage of this pretty fertile land uh, out there. And those folks, um, well, we'll get to one such person. Uh, one such person is this man. This is Jesse Hawley, originally from Connecticut. Um, Hawley moved out to the Seneca River um, where he decided he would begin a grain forwarding um, company. Uh, so taking kind of all the grain that's being grown around Seneca Lake, um, picking it up in Geneva, milling it in Seneca Falls, uh, and then the hope was that while individual farmers kind of couldn't compete in markets, if he got all these different farmers together, maybe he could make a profit uh, off of this wheat. Turns out he couldn't. Um, he ends up going bankrupt uh, and is sent to debtor's prison in Canandaigua. Uh, there he will um, write a series of essays for the Genesee Messenger. Uh, you know, he's reflecting while he's in jail on how he's ended up there. And he writes a series of essays called the Hercules Essays, calling on New York State to build a canal 
uh, connecting the Great Lakes uh, to the Hudson River in the hopes that, you know, people like him aren't going to end up in the same situation. And you can actually produce agricultural goods in New York for market. Uh, this is one of the, the big arguments in the Hercules essays is uh, how food production will be greatly helped uh, in New York. Takes about a decade uh, after he writes those, but New York uh, listens, uh, essentially. Uh, in 1817, a canal is approved and begins digging on July 4th, 1817 uh, in New York. Um, and uh, to build this 363 mile long waterway, you need a, a giant workforce, uh, really. Um, but then, how are you going to pay them? Um, this is the frontier uh, at the time. There was not a bank on every corner by any means. Uh, cash was pretty scarce. Uh, so instead, workers were uh, often paid a large amount of their salary. Uh, they got board uh, or rooms, so a place to sleep, but a large part of it was your canal contractor. He would feed you uh, and also give you plenty of alcohol uh, to drink as well. Uh, throughout the time. It's estimated that uh, each day on the job, canal workers were paid between 10 and 15 ounces of whiskey um, a day. So, fun job, uh, maybe. No, it wasn't. Um, but the saying was, no one would dig a canal sober. Uh, but yeah, food production is, or payment in food is a large part of a canal laborer's uh, salary. Uh, also, you know, to support this pool of labor, um, you needed kind of infrastructure behind them to support them. Um, and while most of the work actually digging the canal is done by men, uh, there are also a number of, of cooks who accompany, uh, largely women, um, the, the canal laborers. Oftentimes, they're the wives of one of the laborers. Uh, this is a fascinating uh, object in our collection. Uh, it is a kettle owned by Christine Davis. Uh, who her husband uh, helped dig the canal, and uh, this does not do it justice. I always mean to, it's a gigantic, uh, like, cauldron. You could definitely feed a whole team uh, of men with it. Um, yeah, and so she accompanies um, this Erie Canal work crew uh, all through the digging of the original canal, then moves on to Ohio, where her husband is uh, helping build their canals, uh, before ultimately reaching Arkansas, um, where this kettle is used by the family every year to make apple butter uh, until they donated it to us in 2017. So it's a, a really special object in our collection and, and shows the importance of food uh, in the construction process. Uh, another important thing to acknowledge uh, is at this time, um, the institution of slavery was still legal in New York State. Uh, and most uh, enslaved people in New York, at least in upstate New York, were involved in some way in the production uh, of food, either uh, in agriculture or in domestic service, so working as uh, cooks or maids and serving food uh, and producing it, right? Um, and, and one such man uh, is the person pictured here. Uh, this is the Reverend Thomas James. Uh, he was born enslaved in Canajoharie, New York uh, in either 1803 or 1804, uh, right in the Mohawk Valley. Uh, he spent the first 15 to 20 years of his life uh, performing agricultural work here in the Mohawk Valley in Canajoharie and nearby. Um, but as they were digging the Erie Canal through Canajoharie, Thomas James saw his opportunity and followed the staked out route of the canal. It hasn't been built yet, but they've, they've laid out a line, uh, pretty much leading all the way to the Canadian border. He would cross there, uh, helped dig the uh, Welland Canal, uh, Canada's response to the Erie for about a season or two uh, before returning to New York where he got a job uh, in one of the bustling uh, grain warehouses uh, in Rochester. Uh, there he learned how to, how to read by the end of his career. Uh, at that warehouse, he was in charge of the entire freight shipping operation, uh, at which point he retired and became an AME Zion Church minister and became a very uh, prominent uh, abolitionist speaker throughout uh, New York and the Northeast um, eventually. So fascinating story uh, whose 
a lot of his life relates to the foodways and the changing foodways caused by the Erie Canal. Um, so let's look at some more ways the Erie Canal will change how New Yorkers interact with food. So prior to the canal's construction, it would take about 30 days to get from Buffalo to New York City. And it takes, if you're shipping a ton of grain on the Erie Canal, it was estimated it would cost you about $100. After the canal is built, it takes five to seven days to make the same voyage, and it costs less than $10 to ship the same amount of grain. This is transformative for New York's economy and how they can make food. Uh, shipping prices are brought all the way down. The big thing about shipping things like grain, or like we're gonna talk about salt, these big bulk product, products, you know, you can grow grain like wheat just about anywhere, really. Um, the big thing is cutting down on your overhead costs. Um, so you can't compete in the market. You have to sell things like wheat, like salt, as cheaply as possible in order to make a profit. It's counterintuitive, but that's how it works. Um, so yeah, cutting out those transportation costs are huge for these industries. Uh, one of the areas most impacted by it is where my museum is, uh, Syracuse. Uh, Syracuse quickly evolves into the salt city. There are naturally occurring salt springs and there are salt beds underground uh, in Syracuse um, that once the canal opens, so too does the salt industry, essentially. It already existed before then, but afterwards, the floodgates have opened. Um, by the mid-century, uh, over half of America's salt is produced in Syracuse. It's called uh, white gold. You can see in the uh, top corner there um, some vignettes of the extensive salt fields of Syracuse. Um, additionally, You've got thousands of people now traveling on this waterway, and all those people need a place to sleep, place to eat, generally, right? Um, it's hard to be a human being and not do those things, uh, you know? Uh, so, in every town on the canal, hotels spring up to service uh, these travelers. Uh, obviously, the primary purpose of the hotel is for you to sleep in it, but also on the lower floor, almost all of them would have uh, some sort of a, a public house or um, kind of an early version of a restaurant uh, that you could stop in. Uh, over there, uh, we see Syracuse's finest of these early uh, hotels, the Syracuse House. You can see right off the Erie Canal in pretty much every town, even the smallest ones. I'm, I'm originally from Chittenango, New York. Um, I went to elementary school, Bolivar Road Elementary. I never knew there was a town of Bolivar or a, like hamlet of Bolivar because it doesn't exist anymore. But in the 1840s, 1850s, they even had a, a hotel in them. So everywhere has these places you can stop, get a room for the night and, and food to eat. Um, speaking of stopping, um, the Erie Canal uh, will also introduce to America one of its great traditions and pastimes, the traffic jam. Um, yeah, so uh, those 83 locks we talked about, um, they take time to get through, uh, about 15 minutes a piece. If you're at a place like Lockport, which has five locks all in a row, that takes about an hour and a half to, to get through. Um, so you get boats kind of stopped at these locks, you get traffic jams, because um, you know, 15 minutes for one boat, uh, and people see the advantage of that. You know, you got all these stopped canalers, they start building grocery stores right next to the canal, uh, as we see uh, up here, uh, the JG Berzalara uh, grocery. Uh, you can also see ice harvesting becomes a thing along the canal, you know, it gets cold here uh, in the winter, or at least it used to. Um, and ice harvesting becomes a big thing in the winter. Uh, you can also see uh, stimulated, they're not just feeding humans on the Erie Canal. All these boats are towed by uh, mules and horses. You can see 
uh, over on the side there. Uh, you can also stop in at this grocery store and buy oats and hay for all of your, um, for your engine. You know, this is your gas station too, more or less, right? Um, yeah, and there's, there's a pretty big industry in making the stuff you need to, to feed a mule uh, too. Um, but perhaps nowhere is more impacted uh, its foodways uh, than Rochester. Rochester's fascinating. It becomes uh, the Erie Canal's boomtown. Uh, literally, the term boomtown is coined to describe what happens to Rochester after the canal opens in it. Um, another nickname of Rochester at this time, the Young Lion of the West, um, because you know, it's, it's roaring um, right after the canal opens, because a kind of a perfect storm uh, hits Rochester when the canal opens. So Rochester has, it's perched right on the lip, uh, essentially, of the Great Falls uh, of the Genesee, or the High Falls, uh, which you can see over here which are able to provide tons and tons of water power. The Genesee Valley also is incredibly fertile. Um, and between Rochester and what's now Letchworth State Park, the Genesee is a pretty navigable river. Um, so farmers who grow crops uh, in the Genesee Valley can easily ship their, their grain to Rochester. But then, the missing piece comes in with the Erie Canal. This cheap transportation thing makes it so this town explodes. Tons and tons, uh, I believe it's something like, uh, I wanna say around 50 uh, mills uh, spring up right along the falls taking advantage uh, of this water. At its peak, Rochester will produce 25,000 bushels of flour a day. Um, or it'll process 25,000 bushels of wheat a day, I should say, uh, and Rochester quickly becomes known as the flower city. Um, it's producing, again, more than half at one point of America's entire flower supply. The, the price of flour in New York City is, and like in the stock market commodities game, is pegged on Rochester. Uh, and you can see uh, just how important the canal is. This is an early picture over here of one of the earliest mills in Rochester right on the banks of the canal. So you can easily grind up your flour, put it on a canal boat, and send it down to generally New York. Um, but you can also go as far west as Minnesota uh, on the canal. So, yeah, and it's some mill, warehouse, just like that, where Thomas James is, is making a living. Um, I can't remember if I said Rochester becomes known as the Flower City at this point. That's F-L-O-U-R. Remember that. Cultural change happens with this as well. You know, you've got all this industrialization, growing towns, um, and a lot of different things happen. Um, you know, of course, politicians start taking advantage of it, and they start, you know, like I said, everyone eats and drinks, right? Um, Back in this point in American history, people sure like to drink. Uh, this is an interesting uh, political cartoon um, from the election of, yes, 1840, right. Uh, this is the famous Tippecanoe and Tyler II campaign. All right, everyone knows that saying, uh, but the Whig party at the time had two main symbols uh, to show that William Henry Harrison was a man of the people. Um, the log cabin and a barrel of hard cider, um, which, they would build these log cabins in, in every major city and town. It's kind of their, their campaign headquarters, right? And, and a lot of the canal towns end up uh, building these log cabins. Um, Syracuse is only about a block north uh, of the canal. Uh, and from these log cabins, they quite liberally uh, distributed uh, cider uh, to people who they'd like to vote. It's a good strategy if you can, can pull it off, right? Um, and um, this kind of a revolution at the time politically. Um, Western New York in this election, even though New York's own Martin Van Buren is running for president, uh, Western New York is going to swing that election in New York uh, for William Henry Harrison, and it's going to be one of the major electoral victories Harrison's going to get to bring him uh, into the presidency, which, as we all know, goes really well for him. Uh, so we can see food ways kind of impacting politics on the canal, uh, even at an early date. Um, though, 
much more interesting, uh, I think at least, and, and with a longer lasting impact than William Henry Harrison's 30 days as president, um, are the new ideas that spring up along the canal. Um, so you've got all these people uh, traveling around, they're bringing new ideas, talking with other people who also have their own new ideas, and a lot of different social movements spring out of the canal. Uh, notably, there's abolition and women's rights. They both have huge influence on the canal and are greatly influenced by the ease of travel. But also going hand in hand with those two uh, reform movements is the temperance movement. Um, so America is a hard drinking lot at this time. See how one major presidential candidate has alcohol as a huge part of his own presidential campaign, right? Um, and people are seeing like issues with this, right? Uh, it's not good if everybody in society is like drunk all the time. Um, and this new religious movement, the Second Great Awakening comes through. You've got people like Charles Grandison Finney um, preaching a new form of Christianity, saying you have a moral responsibility to improve yourself and society. And temperance is part of that movement, right? People start originally just taking personal temperance pledges, saying I won't drink alcohol or I'll drink less of it. Uh, and a lot of times there's a movement away from harder liquors like whiskey to drinking things like beer because it's got a much lower alcohol content, right? Um, and over time, uh, things like what we have in our collection here, uh, home temperance restaurants set up. You know, enough people, there's enough of a movement behind temperance that whole restaurants are being made where people of a like mind uh, can go. Um, and this sort of thing we'll, we'll see spring up um, again later in this talk. Um, yeah, don't know where I was going with that, but. Um, however, things keep changing, not just in New York as well. This is a fascinating map uh, made in the 1850s. Um, what's outlined in yellow on this map is everywhere where their primary port is New York City and they're using the Erie Canal uh, and connected canals to get their products to market. Uh, the red line is what they projected when they enlarged the canal would ultimately do. They did not anticipate railroads, but that's not important right now. Uh, you'll notice um, that in the areas that ship their products via the Erie Canal, uh, you've got places like Ohio, Indiana, Illinois. All these places you might also notice are farther south than New York. They also don't have the hills and rocky terrain of New York. Um, their climates are better for growing things like wheat. Uh, they have longer growing seasons, uh, for instance, and again, more fertile soil um, than even the Genesee Valley. So while the Genesee Valley in that first 20 or so years after the Erie Canal opens, it's the breadbasket of America. A large amount of America's wheat is produced there. But gradually, people start moving via the canal into the Great Lakes Basin. They start establishing farms in places like Ohio and Indiana. And they start growing wheat, and they can grow wheat better and less expensively than New York farmers can. I remember what we were talking about. The key to selling wheat is sell it as cheaply as possible. Uh, so the heart of American wheat agriculture moves farther west. And New York farmers are left having to figure out what to do. Luckily, they already kind of had an example in the Hudson River, which had previously been where a lot of America's wheat was made. Uh, and they start to diversify after about 1850 or so the types of crops that are be gr being grown all along the canal corridor. Uh, here we see uh, some examples. Um, for instance, Rochester, the great flower city. I should also note that while Rochester stops producing a lot of this flour, all those wheat shipments, they're not going there. But they still stay in New York. New York remains integral. And the canal corridor remains integral in America's flour and wheat consumption because all those places, Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, they still gotta ship all that wheat to the eastern seaboard through the Erie Canal, and it all stops in Buffalo. 
Um, so Buffalo becomes a major milling town and an area where they store a lot of the nation's wheat. Um, so the Canal Corridor is still important. Rochester, however, needs to figure out a new shtick. Um, however, one of the first ever uh, commercial uh, nurseries uh, for you know, flowers, shrubs, uh, but also things like fruit trees uh, grows up in Rochester. And Rochester gets a huge commercial nursery business. This is when its nickname changes from the flower F-L-O-U-R city to the F-L-O-W-E-R city. Um, and, and every little town kind of establishes a certain product as its thing. Um, and they, you start making less common um, foodstuffs, things like vegetables, which have higher prices on them. You can more easily compete in the market than you could have with that cheap wheat. Um, so uh, down here in the corner, um, we have one of my favorite pictures in our collection. Uh, this is in Canastota. Anyone know what they're growing there? Oh, I heard one. A lot of people generally say onions because that's what uh, Canastota is now famous for. Um, but it was celery at the time. Was a, which was a luxury product um, because you know it goes bad pretty quickly uh, if it gets warm. So Canastota's got celery, you've got Phelps, they're the sauerkraut capital of the world. Uh, Lions is the peppermint capital. Um, here in the Mohawk Valley, a lot of farmers switch over to dairy. Um, Little Falls becomes known as the cheese capital of the world. They still have their cheese fest uh, to this day. Uh, you can see all the dairy farms there. Uh, the hills of Oneida, Madison, and Otsego County, uh, they take advantage of all these people who are drinking, and uh, about 80% of the nation's hops in, by the 1870s are produced uh, in those three counties that I mentioned. Uh, and a lot of them are shipping to breweries right on the Erie Canal, right? That's what they're picking up there. And, and these Hop picking festivals become major social events uh, for the year. You know, places like Utica and Syracuse's populations during the hop harvest, noticeably their populations will decrease as people go out to take part in this pretty profitable uh, industry um, up in the hills. Um, yeah, so uh, all this diversification happens of industry. Uh, an 1870 uh, agricultural census uh, will find uh, that New York State is the most productive agricultural state uh, in the United States, and it is also um, has the most diverse agriculture. Um, the five biggest vegetable producing counties in America are all in New York. Uh, oddly enough, uh, they're Brooklyn, Queens, and Manhattan are like the top three, uh, but then Monroe County, where Rochester is, uh, and Erie County, where uh, Buffalo is, are the uh, next two largest. Um, so yeah, uh, agriculture still goes strong throughout much of that classic towpath era uh, of the canal, but it's not just agriculture uh, that is impacted by the Erie Canal. So you've got these cities growing and everything, uh, and rapidly industrializing towns like Utica, Syracuse, Rochester, Schenectady, Buffalo, etc. So these factories start growing, and they start producing. While they can't, New York farmers can't as effectively grow wheat anymore. They can help the places that do more efficiently grow wheat make it even more efficiently. Uh, you have a lot of agricultural implement uh, companies spring up uh, on the banks of the canal or near the canal. Uh, we see over here the Syracuse Chilled Plow Company. Um, it's uh, one of the earlier steel plows. It's a sturdy plow. It's uh, kind of what helps. It's really well suited uh, for digging up the Great Plains. Um, so a lot of the agriculture out there is done with Syracuse chilled plows. Uh, that bottom image, it's an iconic canal image. Um, everyone knows it because it's a great shot of the mules pulling the boats. But if you look on the other side of the canal, um, that's an international harvester uh, factory right across uh, from it. You know, those things can be shipped out to the Midwest. Um, the McCormick Reaper, uh, its first successfully commercially produced in Brockport, New York, right on the banks of the canal uh, as well. 
also the um, New York manufacturers start taking uh, advantage of new industrial processes, um, specifically canning. So by the late 1800s, you know, we're going to get into this bit more. Railroads are starting to outcompete the canal um, because they're faster, they're more efficient. A lot of times, yeah, you can just get things places quicker, which is always good. However, the Erie Canal, because it's slower, it generally charges lower prices. Uh, and if you've got stuff that doesn't need to get anywhere in a hurry, you can ship stuff still on the canal profitably. A new technology comes along, mid-1800s, that makes it so food doesn't have to move as quickly. And that is canning, right? Tons of canneries in the second half of the 19th century grow up on the banks of the canal. Perhaps the most famous of these is the beech nut factory um, in Kanujahari. Um, they start out making uh, vacuum sealed hams, uh, but will eventually uh, branch out into a number of different uh, food products. Uh, most famously, they're gum and uh, baby food, uh, but they make a ton of different canned products. Um, in central New York, there's the Merrill Sewell Canning Factory. They own 21 different canneries uh, on the banks uh, of the Erie Canal. Uh, they're most famous for none such mincemeat, if anyone knows that brand, uh, but they also make a bunch of other stuff too. Um, and also working in these factories now, you've got tons and tons of people who have to work at each one of the, these plants. And traditionally, you know, if you're working on a farm, which is what the majority of people did in America uh, up to this point, midday came, you could take some time off, go back home, eat lunch, right? And then go back out and work the farm some more. Now, if you're working in a factory, that's not really an option anymore. Your house, who knows where it is? You might have taken a streetcar uh, there. Also, you know, this is the 1900s. They don't give you huge breaks. Um, this, this is an era not famous for that, right? Um, so you gotta find new places to, to eat your lunch and stuff, right? Uh, so restaurants really start to develop at this time to, to service these crowds of not just factory workers, but you've also got clerks and business people, bankers, et cetera, all living in these cities. They want to go out to eat. Uh, so restaurants start to form uh, at this time. Uh, up here, you can see Syracuse's Clinton Square. Um, this is one of the hotels in Syracuse uh, that develops over time. The Empire House, um, their restaurant is particularly famous. It's an early kind of buffet you can go to, you know, they have like heat lamps and stuff that can keep your food warm and things. They're taking advantage of these new um, technologies that are existing for food. Uh, remember we talked about earlier, you didn't have a lot of options, regardless of who you were, of what you're eating. You're eating stews, stews, baked meats, or roasted meat, right? There's new technology coming around that allows you to cook new things in new ways, uh, combine things differently. Uh, also, you know, quicker transportation makes it so you can get more ingredients. Uh, oysters really take off. Um, they're the big fad when the canal first opens. Everyone's like writing letters about how they can eat oysters now in upstate New York, because you know, they'd go bad uh, around like Little Falls um, if you were trying to bring them up before the canal. Um, yeah, so that's huge. Uh, and now let's talk a little about the, the people who are working in these uh, factories, in these restaurants, et cetera, because you've got a huge workforce that's necessary. And um, a lot of them are gonna be immigrants who bring with them their own uh, unique food cultures. Um, originally, uh, kind of your earliest immigrants in a lot of cases, um, they're from northern, Central Europe, uh, places like England. This is a huge brewery that will grow up along the canal. Uh, Greenways Brewing in Syracuse. They produce specifically uh, ales, um, which are a traditionally English style of beer. Somehow, my PowerPoint deleted a picture of uh, a bunch of German immigrants. Um, you know, they bring their own uh, very sausage heavy culture uh, with them um, and, and meat production in general. Um, you know, my, my grandfather and great-grandfather, immigrant from Germany in Syracuse, 
he was a butcher his whole life, right? Um, it's a big thing in, in German communities. Um, they found uh, a lot of these German immigrants companies that we know uh, to this day. You would have seen a bunch of German meat packers at the A.C. Hoffman factory, um, still functioning today, making Hoffman's hot dogs, right? Um, but Germans come, Irish, uh, Polish immigrants. Um, you know, we're here in... Uh, here in Utica, so I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Italian immigrants, and they all bring their own food cultures and interact with the situation that they're in, um, wherever they are, um, and, and adapt to that uh, as well. Um, and a number of Syracuse, or the Canal Corridor's uh, most notable foods uh, relate to this Canal era time period um, and some of the trends we talked about. Uh, one is what's pictured here, uh, the beef on weck, uh, one of Buffalo's uh, most noted food items, right? Um, so the beef on weck um, stems from what we were talking about, that prohibition or the temperance movement. Uh, there starts becoming uh, new movements to create laws that will restrict the ability of people to uh, consume alcohol. Uh, one they land on in the 1870s is that you have to buy food. Uh, in order to, uh, to get a drink. Um, I know, impossible for us to imagine such a rule. Um, but a lot of these immigrant communities end up living on the banks of the canal because as, as still happens today, um, these kind of undesirable neighborhoods um, places where people don't really want to live, and the canal is one such place. The canal smells horrible most of the year. Um, you know, canal, canalers are uh, notoriously kind of a rough lot uh, in general, so a lot of times you have these immigrant communities uh, end up being marginalized uh, to the banks of the canal. And a lot of them service these canalers. Uh, notably in uh, Buffalo, there's a big German community um, on the canal. Um, and there's a lot of taverns. You know, we've talked about these canalers like to drink. Um, so these German tavern keepers, quite angry uh, about the fact that, you know, they now have to sell food um, to go with their beer. Then they hit on an idea. You know, they think about their own food cultures. Uh, roast beef, pretty prominent in, in Germany, also very salty. And they also think about the Kummelweck roll, which is originally from Germany as well which is, uh, as you may know, coated in salt. And what does salt make you do? Drink, Drink right, yes. So uh, they get back at the state for this law uh, by making the saltiest meal they can possibly think of uh, and hopefully you know, increase their profits uh, that way uh, by creating this iconic sandwich uh, of the canal. Uh, also related to salt, um, Central New York's, um, well, Syracuse's most notable dish also has a connection. We talked about those extensive salt fields. Uh, it's grueling work. Um, you're boiling away this water. It's a million degrees, and not literally, but in these uh, salt boiling areas. It's incredibly hot, uh, can be occasionally dangerous work. So these hard jobs that also don't pay great, um, again, often fall to immigrants. Uh, in Syracuse's case, uh, on the north side, it's largely German and Irish immigrants. Um, the Irish, of course, well known for their fondness for potatoes, um, bring potatoes with them to work, right? And toss their potatoes into these boiling salt vats. And when the salts, or when the water's boiled away, you're left with the salt, uh, but also uh, delicious salt potatoes as well. Um, very interestingly, um, one of the only other places uh, in the world that has salt potatoes, uh, Brittany in France, that was one of Europe's major salt producing areas as well. They, they created a similar dish kind of independently. So yeah, there's um, some unique ways the Erie Canal impacted the foods that we still eat to this day in upstate New York. So New York, it's doing well in terms of preparing food, in terms of growing food uh, throughout the 1900s. Um, but New York realizes like, hey, there's other states out there. Uh, they might outcompete New York farmers uh, and, and the 
state government really wants to encourage uh, innovation a lot of the time, um, as does the New York State Agricultural Society. Uh, and in 1848, they land on an idea of how to uh, improve innovation amongst New York's uh, farmers and agricultural manufacturers, and that is uh, the New York State Fair. Uh, first hosted in Syracuse in 1848, it actually rotates through 12 different cities um, in New York. Um, Utica is one of those cities uh, as well. Uh, so different farmers from around the country can go, uh, around the state, excuse me, can go to the fair and learn about kind of the latest in agricultural uh, products and techniques. Uh, down in the bottom corner, uh, you can see a postcard we have from the state fair uh, of a tractor display. So you can go learn about like, hey, what's the best type of tractor you got? You know, nowadays if you go to the state fair, you know, it's kind of cute when there's like prize winning pig, right? And you don't think about it. Um, but like that had a purpose. Uh, it still does to this day. Um, if you had a prize winning pig or cow, like we have pictured here, you're gonna have that cow breed with the rest of the cows in New York. If there's any bovine people out there, I apologize. I Probably, they're probably not cows. I can never remember. Steer or cattle. It says cattle there, so I'll go with that. Anyway, um, yeah, and you know, you can make money having your prize winning pig mate with all the other pigs, but it also improves the stock of all the pigs in New York. It's kind of uh, the idea of that. So that's why you have that. And also, uh, it's a great social occasion. Uh, people will go meet. Uh, one another, you know, a lot of people find their spouses at things uh, like the state fair and whatnot. Uh, also, people from the general public can go learn about the new food products that are being produced, like those uh, beech nut products, or like we have up here, um, an advertisement um, for the New York State Fair uh, with a new type of, of pancake flour uh, that's available. And you can still do that to this day uh, at the state fair, which in the early 1900s, well, late 1800s, uh, permanently settled uh, in Syracuse, where you can still visit today. Food, of course, um, still plays a major role uh, in the State Fair, but mainly just so you can see what types of food you can deep fry and consume. Foodways develop a lot over the time period of the canal, but like I talked about before, by the late 1800s, the railroads are starting to outcompete the Erie Canal. By the 1890s, people are talking about what do we do with this canal? It's not worthwhile to operate anymore as is with you know, your mule name sail pulling your canal boat. Some people want to just you know, pack it in, close down the canal. However, one prominent group of people who are against that are grain merchants. Remember, Buffalo still has these giant grain silos, grain warehouses, uh, and New York City still needs Lots and lots of grain uh, to feed all their people and flour. Uh, so some of the chief lobbyists for a new, bigger canal uh, are these grain merchants uh, because they fear that if a cheaper public option, which the canal represented, uh, were to close, the New York Central pictured here, um, they're gonna have a monopoly essentially on the transshipment of products like grain across New York. If they have a monopoly, they can charge essentially whatever they want, which is good for the railroads, at least short term, but like we've talked about, to ship grain profitably, you gotta keep those prices down as much as you can. Um, so Theodore Roosevelt, uh, when he's governor, not a friend of monopolies as well, and you know, as the Panama can show, a fan of canals, um, he kind of spearheads this project to build a new bigger canal that could have self-propelled boats carry a lot more stuff. And uh, that's how we get the Barge Canal, opened in 1918. Uh, it will uh, serve its purpose well it, uh, at its height. Uh, I believe it's um, 31 million bushels of wheat travel down uh, the canal in one year in the 1930s, as well as a bunch of other uh, agricultural product, products or food products. Uh, my favorite is a shipment of eels from Oswego to New York City. Um, and yeah, the, the Barge Canal 
continues to play an important role in transporting uh, food stuff um, all the way up to about the 1960s. Uh, if you go down to, to New York City today, um, Brooklyn, Gowanus Bay, they have these massive grain elevators uh, built specifically for the Barge Canal. For a while, until a couple of years ago, uh, Oswego had the same thing, these huge um, grain silos um, that showed the importance of grain to the Barge Canal. By the time of about World War II, uh, America's transportation network is pretty much complete. Uh, you know, the interstates are still being built, uh, but the transportation advantages that New York had enjoyed are largely gone. Those more diversified uh, products that New York had been able for a while to maintain and keep selling profitably, well, now you've got places like the Rio Grande Valley in Texas, Florida, Southern California, all places with much longer growing seasons with such fertile ground that they can grow a lot of these uh, vegetables and stuff um, that New York had been producing so much. And uh, you know, that kind of agriculture starts to fade away more uh, in New York. A uh, hop blight hits the hops. Uh, and also, you can now just as easily grow hops in Washington, Oregon, and transport them just as cheaply as if they were in New York, right? And also, new technologies are making it so bigger and bigger companies are able to dominate more and more market share. And it especially helps if you're kind of like centrally located. Um, you know, think of uh, General Mills based out of Minneapolis. However, they will have a major site in Buffalo uh, as well. You get more and more homogenized food, which is a huge development at this time. You know, it's, it's considered kind of a miracle of science in like the 40s and 50s that you can get a bag of flour in San Francisco that tastes about the same as a bag of flour uh, in, in Boston, right? Um, the quality is going to be the same. It's all incredible, you know. Wonder Bread is a wonder, right? Um, that, you know, it's the same everywhere. Uh, and things get homogenized. Uh, this really hurts New York State agriculture. We've already talked about the land isn't as fertile as places like California or Nebraska, uh, et cetera. Um, a lot of farms go out of business uh, in New York around this time. You know, agriculture starts to see a decline, uh, as do a lot of uh, these smaller food producing uh, companies. Uh, the ones who survive are places like we have here, uh, Genesee. They, uh, they innovate in their own special ways, uh, stay in the market. Genesee did it with cream ale and Genesee Light, some of the first two of its kind uh, here in Utica. You know, Matt's Brewing, uh, they innovate with you know, great advertising campaigns like Schultz and Dooley, um, the mascots of my wedding last year. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, even by the 1970s, these things are starting to get stale, uh, however, with kind of the late 60s, early 70s, people start questioning these homogenized products that are going into uh, our bodies, right? Uh, how we're producing things, where our food comes from, how it's made. Um, and new food movements start to uh, grow um, that are reflected all along the canal corridor. You've got things like the farm to table uh, movement. You've got agro-tourism. People are specifically want to go and experience like what life on a farm is like. Though generally, that's not the experience you're probably getting uh, at most agro-tourism uh, industries. But uh, you know, farm to table is huge, gluten-free, veganism, uh, et cetera. Uh, all of that changes how people uh, eat. Uh, and we can see kind of all the different, and also you've got new communities moving into the Canal Corridor, bringing their own unique foodways with them as well. And I'll uh, end the talk on Syracuse um, as kind of a case study of how these new movements have transformed uh, the Canal Corridor. Uh, one, you've got the Evergreen Restaurants, a block down the street from the Canal Museum in a former canal building, the oldest in Syracuse, actually. Uh, this is a, a restaurant that specifically caters to an audience that's interested in eating almost entirely New York 
grown uh, food, uh, also has an extensive uh, collection of gluten-free and vegan uh, options for people, again, using New York State made uh, products. Uh, over there, you see the Salt City Market, one of Syracuse's uh, newest buildings. Um, it incorporates a lot of the newer immigrant communities into it. It is a, a food um, kind of court sort of thing um, that has, I believe, eight or nine different restaurants uh, representing the different uh, immigrant and ethnic groups within Syracuse. Um, it's a great place to go to um, from all over the place. Um, You've got Burmese, uh, which you see there. Um, in the middle, you got Vietnamese, Baghdad restaurant, which is uh, Middle Eastern. Um, and, and you can see the way that these, these different immigrant communities are impacting all different uh, canal communities and their, their food ways. Um, right before this, me and Patrick had a delicious uh, Bosnian meal. I had never had Bosnian cuisine before, but right, there's a growing population of Bosnians here in, in Utica. Um, yeah, and so you've got this new rich food culture uh, and that, that specification we had seen as people start looking for new and unique foods, uh, you see that playing out in the, the canal. Where I'm from, Chittenango, there's, there's a bison farm now. People want, I don't know, bison burgers and crap. Um, you can sell it for even more money though, right? Uh, and make that profitable. Little Falls has a water buffalo farm uh, in it. Um, also, um, there's a new effort to mitigate the effects of, of climate change and potential drought brought by it uh, to use in western New York canal waters um, to uh, irrigate farmers' fields, um, which will also, because they'll be able to rely on a steady stream of water, grow more high-value crops. Uh, notably, there's, there's herd orchards out in Holly, New York. They've actually been irrigating uh, their crops since the 1930s with canal water, but they've expanded that uh, immensely uh, lately, they grow things like cherries, peaches, apples, of course. Um, yeah, and even last year's U.S. Open uh, out in Rochester, it's greens watered by canal waters. That's where we are with foodways in New York uh, today um, and probably into the future. Uh, thank you.